We are going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 12 today. 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 12. We are in a sermon series on overcoming. We've talked about a lot of different things, overcoming fear and anxiety and depression and addiction we talked about last week. Um, this week we're going to talk about overcoming money issues. Overcoming money issues. Um, 1 Timothy is a wonderful book written by the Apostle Paul to Timothy, uh, a pastor in training perhaps, a church planner, and a wonderful word for all of us in there. Speaking of overcoming money issues, doesn't money just make people crazy? Like it really does. Money makes the world go round, but it makes the world crazy. Case in point. There was a story of this rich heiress. Her dad had just tons of money and, and she'd just been married in the last year and she was just miserable. She was suspicious of her husband and um, she confronted him one day. They were alone in the house and, and she said, you know, I, I just think you only married me because my daddy left me a lot of money. And the husband was shocked. He was like, no, that's just not true. He said, I don't care who left you the money. <laughs> but don't shh. We need our drummer. That tells you what money does to our thought process. Anyone here have all the money they'll ever need? Maybe you do and you just don't know it. Hmm? The Bible has a lot to say about money and how to deal with it. So let's dig in. 1 Timothy 6, starting in verse 6. It says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Let's, let's stop there for a second. That's a wonderful notion to say and to think about. But you hold that up against what the world says about money and its oil and water. It's two different things. Now, before we dig in any further, the verse starts, verse 6 starts, but godliness with contentment, that word but. When you see that, if you start in a scripture like that, go back and see what it was talking about. Because you got to, you know, that's there for a reason. What was just written has something to do with this. And what was just written, basically, Paul is telling Timothy that godliness is not a means to financial gain. Prosperity teachers who promise riches are false. I think some churches and some people think you say a few magic words and God waves a magic wand and everything's sunshine and bubbles and money pours out of heaven. <laughs> and I think those who read the word and know the word and study the word and see what God requires of us, that didn't happen to the disciples. They, they worked and they struggled, but they were obedient and God blessed them. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Are you content with simply being godly? Do you even know what that means? That's a Christianese word, be godly. Like not everybody goes to church. You walk up to somebody on the street and say, hey, what does it, be, what does it mean to be godly? You're probably going to get about 30 different answers. They'll be close. But to properly apply the word, you've got to know what it means. So let's go to the original Greek. Paul wrote this in Greek. And the word godliness in Greek is eusabea. Eusabea. And it means a godly heart response that naturally expresses itself in reverence for God and the things that he calls sacred. 
It's your godly heart response. This is like how your soul, how your inner being responds to God without you having to think about it. A godly heart response, and it naturally expresses itself. You don't manufacture this. You are so in tune with God that your natural response is reverence for Him and the things that He calls good, which are His commandments. And that's what godliness is. And we are to be content with that. And that alone, because it's great gain, the Word says. You brought nothing into the world and you'll take nothing out of it. If I heard my grandma say that once, I heard her say it a hundred times. No U-Hauls in a funeral procession. Last week we learned that every good and perfect gift comes down from God. Here's the deal. If he wants you to have money, you'll have money. Even if he doesn't want you to have money and you work hard, you'll have money. Like you can get money. But what's your heart attitude about money? If he wants you to have money, you'll have money, and you'll have it by revering him and not the money. Being obedient to God while being happy with whatever that brings is great gain. Great gain. Have you tried it? Have you honestly tried to be content with a godly heart response that reveres the things of God and the things that he calls excellent? Have you tried it? Have you endured in it? If just your basic needs are provided, why not be content with that and show God's love through that? It's easy to gather around the water cooler when you're living... You know, there's too much month at the end of the money and commiserate with everybody at work and talk about how miserable everything. Misery loves company. And it just, you keep getting further and further and further down. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Here, are, you, are you content? Are you content? You know the answer to that. I don't, and I'm not pointing fingers. I'm just asking a question. You know. Am I really, am I, am I happy? Am I just always looking for more and thinking about more? This world can make you discontented quickly if you allow it. Contentment is mentioned multiple times in today's passage. Being happy with what you got. Verse 9. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Do you want to get rich? You will be tempted. <laughs> Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap. Not they may, you will be tempted. And you fall into a trap. If that is your original desire, I want to get rich no matter the cost, you're going to fall into a trap. And we talked about traps last week. People fool themselves and think they'll see a trap. A trap is meant to not be seen. The best traps are invisible. I talked about going out with my granddad on checking his trap lines in the morning. You knew where he put them, but you still had to look because they were hidden real well. Don't fool yourself. You will be tempted if you want to get rich. Matthew 6, 21 through 24 says, Where your treasure is, your heart will be. What do you treasure the most? Even children are not on the same level as God when we come to treasure things. If God is not your top treasure, 
then your heart is not in God. Where your heart, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. You can treasure your children. You can treasure blessings. But God is to be first. You can't serve two masters. You'll hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and money. It's harmful and it leads to ruin. Last week we talked about King Solomon who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. You want to talk about money. Here's the richest man that will ever have lived, to ever have lived. He had so much money, it's crazy. Like I think, I forget, there was one nation that sent him 666 talents of gold every year. Like it's 24 metric tons of gold he got just from one entity. In his day, they said silver was worthless because there was just so much gold. Think about that. And he searched for the meaning of life. He took all his money and all his wherewithal and he searched for the meaning of life and he found out everything but God's meaningless. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 10 says, Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. Chasing after wealth is meaningless. Again, God wants you to have money, you'll have money. And if you want to have money, work. Now, let's see, we are 15 minutes into a message about money and I haven't brought up tithing yet. How about that? Here it comes. <laughs> Tithing is a good gauge of your heart attitude towards money. I think God knows that. He knows we need money. Our Father knows the things we need. He knows what we need. The verse says those eager for money can wander from God, wander away. Not tithing, I believe, is wandering from God when I read his word. And choose the grief that comes with it. Those eager to please God know that money is a gift to be stewarded well to advance the good news of Jesus. You have blessings from God for a reason. He has expectations of you and those blessings he gives you. And the better you steward them, the more blessings he gives those who are faithful with little can be trusted with much. Are you faithful with your little? You can run and wear yourself out <sighs> chasing after money. Matthew 16, 26. What does it forfeit a man to gain the whole world? What, is it, what does it gain to... to, to, to what does it benefit a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his very soul? Or what can you exchange for your soul? Your soul is priceless. Priceless. Verse 11. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. You know, there's just things in this world that are worth pursuing, right? And the older you get, the more you realize the things that are really worth pursuing. Like when I was in my 20s, I wanted nothing more than a midnight blue Lincoln Town car. Like, seriously, I was focused on that, man. I thought they were the coolest looking things. And now that's just not so important. I've had my Explorer for 17 years, and she's a rust bucket, but she's mine, and she's paid off. And gets me where I want to go. And that's a blessing from God. There are things in this world worth pursuing and things that are worth fleeing from. Danger, Will Robinson. Run, Forrest, run. <laughs> Men and women of God flee from pursuing riches and engage in worthwhile pursuits. God will put you 
in front of kings, his word says it. I was with Bob Sullivan Friday night at a dinner, a pre-dinner for the uh, men's rally in the valley in Youngstown. And we, it, was, it was bizarre. There were 10 people at my table. Two were confirmed millionaires who loved Jesus and funded this rally in the valley. It was free. A man sitting across from me and his wife described himself as the Billy Graham of Pakistan. Anwar uh, Fazil showed me his YouTube videos. You want to see the multitude of crowds this man preaches to. Right there in Dutch House in Columbia, Ohio. And Willie Robinson just happened to be there from Duck Dynasty, too. And, you know, God, God knows what you need. He provides what you need. Pursue him. He will put you in situations where you can make him famous and not yourself famous. And when you do that, he knows what you need, and he comes in and, and he provides. He provides. He blesses. Isn't it funny when you look at verse 11 and all the things we're supposed to pursue? Sound familiar? Righteousness, faith, love, gentleness, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. You can't get away from that fruit of the Spirit when you are walking in step with the Holy Spirit. And that is what we are to pursue. When we pursue those things, we become those things, and we produce those things. That's why you are to pursue them. And that word pursue, what's that mean? Like when you, pers when you picture a pursuit, like a high-speed chase, or like a lion running down a gazelle, like that's a pursuit. Are you pursuing those things or just thinking happy thoughts about them? That's not pursuit. So, look at all those things. Pursue righteousness. Do you pursue righteousness? Or just Google it. Well, it's cool and all, but it's just not for me. I got stuff to do. <laughs> 1 Peter 1.16, God said, be holy as I am holy. That's not a suggestion. To be holy, you better be pursuing righteousness. And that's not a holier-than-thou mentality looking down your nose at everybody else. It's knowing that you've got work to do between you and God, and you put in the work, and then you love Him, heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you love others the way He loves you. That's righteous. Being bullhorn guy and yelling at people or looking down on sinners is just being a bully. That's all that is. That's not righteousness. Pursue godliness. Do you pursue godliness? We learned earlier that godliness, that word, eusebia, is a godly heart response to the things he calls good. Do you pursue that? You read the word, you know what he calls good. What's your response to that? Or do you just go through the motions and wonder why, why aren't things working out for me, man? Come on, God. Like, that righteousness stuff and that godliness, that's cool. I'm down for that. Are you? Are you pursuing it? Do you pursue it? Do you pursue faith or do you constantly question it? The new hot thing is to deconstruct your faith. Oh, I've deconstructed my faith and I've learned that the Bible, you know, it changes with time and, you know, things just aren't the same as they used to be. And you can make anything fit if you want to deconstructing faith like when I I can't even comprehend that how do you deconstruct faith if you deconstruct faith you destroy it I don't get it it's just an excuse to not do what God said because it's easier to do that honestly
If God makes me rich, then I'll believe, right? There's faith, huh? <laughs> uh, that's putting God to the test, which is forbidden, by the way, Deuteronomy 6.16. Although, there is a test that God does approve of that has to do with money. Malachi 3, 8 through 10. God says, you rob me. How do, you, how do we rob you, God? In tithes and offerings. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Test me in this, says God, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there won't be room enough to store it. God dares you to tithe. He dares you to do it. Test me in this, he says. Have you done it? Have you tried it? It's 10%. It's really not that much, honestly, when you get used to it. It's painful at first, don't get me wrong. God blesses it. You don't miss it. God blesses it. Do you pursue love? Pursue love. And I'm not talking about a man or a woman. I'm talking about agape love, sacrificial love. Do you pursue that? Not just for you, but like I said, to learn it, to become it, and to produce it. That's pursuing love. Pursuing love is not a selfish endeavor. It's a sacrificial endeavor. Because to properly pursue Love like that requires love. Money can't buy love. God is love. Pursue him wholeheartedly and he will show you what unconditional love looks like. God says, seek me and my kingdom and my righteousness first. Then all these things will be added unto you. And we get that backwards. We seek the money first and then expect God to bless our actions while we're going after money. And that's not the way it works. You seek Him first and His righteousness. And then He adds those things to you. Do you pursue endurance? What a big word in Christianity. Endurance. Sometimes you do just got to suck it up, man. Get knocked down seven times, get up eight. Do you pursue endurance or do you buckle at the first sign of trouble? Have you given up on God? He hasn't given up on you and money isn't the answer Jesus is. Gentleness. What a, what a slim commodity these days, right? Gentleness. Gentle people stand out, don't, do they not? I think I've shared this story before about probably the most powerful authority figures in my life. And what I mean by that is the power they had to influence me and control me were the most gentle. I don't respond well to being yelled at. I don't respond well to threats. But if somebody's gentle and takes their time with me, I respect that. I appreciate that. That's a wonderful trait. We are to pursue that. Instead of just allowing our heart to grow cold and hard from this world. Because if you allow it to, it will. It will make you cold and hard. And Jesus wants to come in and circumcise your heart. I, I love that verbiage in the Bible. That circumcision of the heart is so important. To cut out all that hard stuff of the world and make your heart soft and tender for what breaks Christ's heart. That makes you gentle. When you really look in the eyes of people every single day and every single person's struggling and has something going on you don't know about. And God knows and we're to represent him and that requires gentleness. Let's finish this up. Verse 12. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. 
You see, this entire passage, when you read it, is a wonderful notion. And it's a wonderful thing to put on a wall or put on a pillow. But if you don't put it into practice, it's meaningless. It's just a notion. And it's meant to be put into practice, not a pillow. It really is. Look at the action verbs. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. Pursue. This is a fight. Faith is not passive. That's why you can't deconstruct it. It's active. Like, I just don't, I don't understand that. Sorry, I'm stuck on that. Stop fighting for money and start fighting for God. Take hold of the eternal life. Man, think about that. How many people you talk to are Christians who are like, you know, they're just kind of gloom and doom Christians. Oh, you know, I'm just waiting around for heaven. Just trying to get by. That's not fighting. That's not taking hold. That's existing. And waiting for eternity, it's now. John 17, 3. God, what's eternal life? John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life starts now. Take a hold of it. Fight for it. Show the world the difference that's out there hurting. When you exude righteousness and godliness and faith and love and endurance and gentleness, all the things the world is looking for. Jesus is eternal life. There's so many scriptures about money. It's mind-blowing. Hebrews 13, 5. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. What a promise. That's a promise. He's saying, you know what, child, you don't have to worry about money. Stop pursuing it. You've got to have it. Money is not the root of all evil. The love of it is. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. That's a promise money can't buy. And it's a free gift of God. Stop pursuing money which is temporary and pursue eternal things. The Apostle Paul wrote somewhere, keep your heart set on things above, not on earthly things. And in the very next verse he wrote, keep your mind set on things above, not on earthly things. It's a heart and mind issue. If your heart and mind are divided, you're in trouble. Your mind might say, you know what, all this stuff is good that God says, but your heart says, I want money. I want to be rich. That's a divided heart. You've got to have heart and mind working in conjunction on this. All right? People are watching, followers of Christ, looking for the difference. Be like Jesus. And if you're sitting out there today, listen, this was written to Christ followers. If you're not a Christ follower and you haven't made that good confession of faith yet, number one, what are you waiting for? <laughs> number two, don't get beat up by all of this. Learn from it. Look at it. These, this is truth. This is truth. And if you have questions, please see me. I'd love to explain it to you. It's not always easy to take the Bible and apply it to your life. If you're here today, the Holy Spirit's working on you. Allow Him to do it. Surrender. Hold up the white flag. Heavenly Father, you're good. I love you. I thank you for your word. Father, help us to be content. Help us to be content.
And while we're being content, Father, may your word and your way circumcise our heart, soften our heart, so that our godly heart response is naturally to revere the things of you, the things that you call good, the things that you call righteous. Father, circumcise our hearts, soften our hearts, break our hearts for what breaks yours, Lord. Help us to not pursue money, but to pursue the things of you, Lord. Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness, Lord. If there's someone out there who's wandered, who's just wandering away, who's been chasing after money, whatever, Lord, may they just see me. Go to the prayer room, whatever it takes, cry out to you, Lord. True change only comes through your son. Help us to press into him. We love you and ask it all in Jesus' name.